Okay, chapter 24, the nervous system. Guys, this is going to be a tough chapter. You're going to need a lot of time to spend learning it and getting ready for the test. Basically, the nervous system is for rapid communications. It has a couple of major types of cells, neurons and neuroglia. Neurons are interconnected cells that communicate via electrical impulses. This is done with a chemoelectric mechanism, which we will describe shortly. The neuroglia are all the support neurons, the support cells that help keep your nerve cells alive. Neurons work together and they form these webs and nets and they interact with animal senses and give us stimuli. Everything that comes to us comes through stimuli. Then it makes decisions about that stimuli and will take an action if necessary. It has several parts. Um, it has kind of an autonomic nervous system uh, and it has uh, a voluntary nervous system. The autonomic nervous system takes care of things like heartbeat and homeostasis and things like that. Um, and then we have our conscious movements. The peripheral nervous system these neurons carry information to and from the central nervous system. The central nervous system is primarily made up of the brain and spinal column, and the peripheral nervous system is made up of all the neurons that collect stimuli and communicate it to the brains, and then they take the orders of the brain to the various parts of the body. So here, sensory input, this bobcat or lynx senses a rabbit, okay? And in a fraction of a second, after he gets that input, because he's hungry, he immediately locks on and tries to chase and predate and eat the rabbit. Here is the parts of a nerve cell. There's the cell body. Now the cell body has all the stuffs in it that a cell needs. <clears throat> okay, so you've got your nucleus and your nucleolus and all of the little and the mitochondria and things like that that you find in nerve cells or any other cells. Then you have dendrites. Dendrites hook up to other axons. Okay, These things just transmit information towards the body. Nerve cells are one-way roads. Nerve impulses can only move in one direction. So a nerve or a neuron cell receives information from the dendrites. Then that nerve impulse travels down through the cell body and through the axon and perhaps it will attach to another nerve cell or it could attach to a muscle cell. If it attaches to something like a muscle cell um, that would be what we call an effector cell. All right. Now, the axon, these little blue things, these are myelin sheaths, and they speed up nerve impulses, all right? And they are what we normally call white matter in the nervous system. And most of the, uh, the, 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 the white matter or the axons with the myelin sheaths go, from, go up and down the body, okay? because it speeds them up, so from your foot to your head, okay? And then unmyelinated axons, those just tend to travel an inch or two, and they're involved in things like uh, uh, instinctual reactions, reflexes, stuff like that. There's the myelin sheath. It's made of fatty insulation. Now, here is the neuron structure and arrangement. So. Um, you get sensory input. Here's a sensory. It's a pain receptor. You step on a tack and your stimulus is pain. So it picks it up and then it shoots it from this little uh, neuron to the next one and it will basically, these are, this is an, uh, an axon, and it shoots the message from here, from this nerve to this nerve. Okay, and then the dendrites receive the nerve impulse and travel down the axon to the dendrites 
of another uh, nerve cell and that goes straight to a muscle and you pull your foot up so that because it hurts that's called a reflex arc okay and reflexes what happens here they don't usually even have to go all the way to the brain there are little nerve ganglia little swellings in the spinal column that take care of uh, nerve reflexes there's no need if, if you step on attack it's if you, if you do something that causes pain you don't have to think about it to pull it off you want to you want to stop that pain as soon as possible because pain indicates damage and so you want to stop that damage as quickly as you possibly can and so it just does a reflex arc something flies towards your face you don't have to think about it you put your hands up to block your face so these sensory nerve nerve neurons sensory neurons now this is an interesting in in a lot of sensory neurons they will have two axons and the nerve cell body is right here now in, in when it has that one axon it will travel towards the nerve cell body and this is an exception to the rule and then another axon will move in this direction these are called bipolar neurons okay they have nothing to do with bipolar disorder um, just coincidence and so they send this pain stimulus here and the spinal cord on a on a reaction like this a reflex reaction immediately will cause the uh, reflex to kick in and you pull your foot up and you're no longer in pain and then you can sit it down and start looking at fixing any damage that has occurred action potentials these are electrical impulses okay and they travel along a neurons axon all right now these are constantly shooting through there okay we are getting bombarded with huge amounts of data coming from all of our sensory neurons and so not all of them are responded to okay there's so much data we have to filter that now what literally happens when an action potential occurs okay what happens is sodiums come into the axon all right sodiums have a positive charge to keep things balanced the potassium moves out but it changes it flips the current across this membrane of the axon where it's normally negative on the inside and positive on the outside it flips to positive on the inside and negative on the outside okay and this is called depolarization it's like taking a battery and flipping it okay because the battery has a positive and a negative end then it has to reset everything um, and that is called the refractory period but this literally as a nerve impulse travels down the axon sodiums are coming in okay and potassiums are going out now as it gets to this point maybe you know at a certain point the part that is already depolarized will start to repolarize and sodiums will be pumped out potassium will be pumped in and it's resetting right behind you so you have two waves going on you have the depolarization and then right behind it the repolarization this is so it can receive another nerve impulse as quickly as possible so the nerve impulse travels down here and goes to the next nerve cell the repolarization is right behind it so that as soon as it finishes repolarizing now another depolarization can occur the depolarization is the action potential okay and then repolarization so let's zone in to a small patch okay of the action potential now here's what happens down here your nerves are normally in what is called the resting state okay and the resting state occurs 
until you receive a stimulus strong enough to depolarize enough of this membrane to start a depolarization event. Once it passes, it repolarizes and comes back to its resting state. Now, if you receive a uh, nerve impulse that isn't strong enough to depolarize enough of an area, then the sensory neuron won't fire. Okay, so, you know, let's say a very, very, a fly lands on your, on your arm or your leg you know, and it's tiny, and you don't even realize it's there, okay, until it bites you. That's the purpose of, our, of hair on our arms and stuff. Having hair on your arms and legs lets you know because each hair is attached to a little nerve sensory input cell, and as a fly or an insect crawls along your, your skin, it will move these little uh, hairs, and then the hairs will uh, fire off an action potential. All right. Now, um, so when you're looking at this, if we stretch this line out, this resting state, you might see it going up and down, but it never hits threshold. Threshold is where the, the, the stimuli is strong enough to depolarize. All right. Now, um, the sodium and potassium ions are basically you have to potassium ions are also positively charged <clears throat> and so what happens when we decide to repolarize we have to pump against the, the gradient so we pump sodium back in and I'm sorry sodium back out and potassium back in potassium is K K plus that's a potassium ion a sodium ion is in a plus Okay. Now, this membrane potential is electric. You could measure it with a voltmeter. All right, so this shows you. We're going to follow along here and see what happens. So here's my resting potential, and we're going to get a little stimuli right there at number one. Okay. Now, the charge different results from the action of these sodium and potassium ions. Okay, and they use ATP to send some ions out of the cell. Um, we're still watching here our resting potential. Okay, there's zero, and this is the current going across. Now, if the stimulus is strong enough, all of the sodium gates will open in the membrane here, along here, and sodium will flush in. Okay, as sodium flushes in, potassium flushes out, and we start to depolarize. Once we hit a certain area, a certain amount of sodium comes in, it's called threshold. That means the stimuli is strong enough to be noticed by our central nervous system, so it starts depolarizing. Now, if you look here, here's the resting potential. There's the negative on the voltmeter right there, and here's where it's setting. And then it eventually goes past zero and goes into the positive on one side. So it flips. Now let me find a good animation. Okay, so here's a nerve that's got a stimulus. This is a nerve cell. And we're going to look at the membrane. Right there. Okay. Now, voltage gated. What that means is as right now it's it's normally it's positive on the outside, negative on the inside. As as sodium ions come in and potassium goes out, the inside becomes less negative and the out, outside becomes less positive until it flips. And so as the current, as the polarization occurs and the current flips, that opens up this sodium channel, okay? And so as the action potential moves down, it continues to open 
these voltage gated channels letting more stuff come in okay so I'm just going to do this little part here channels in the membrane open and close depending on voltage changes across the membrane when no nerve signals are being transmitted these channels are closed a stimulus causes voltage gated sodium channels to open and sodium ions rush into the cell the cell becomes positive on the inside and negative on the outside very quickly, the sodium channels close while voltage-gated potassium channels open, allowing potassium ions to rapidly diffuse out. The cell returns to being positive on the outside and negative on the inside, and the potassium channels close. Meanwhile, the sodium ions inside the cell have diffused to adjacent areas, causing a slight change in the polarity of the membrane ahead of the action potential. This change in polarity causes the voltage-gated sodium channels along this part of the membrane to open. Again, sodium ions rush in and the action potential spreads to the adjacent part of the neuron. In this way, the action potential travels down the neuron like a wave. In the wake of the action potential, potassium leaves the cell, restoring the negative charge inside the neuron. Meanwhile, the sodium-potassium pump has been shuttling sodium ions out and potassium ions in, re-establishing the resting potential distribution of sodium and potassium ions. Okay, so there's a small part of this video. All of these videos I'm going to show you little chunks of are in a playlist at my YouTube channel, and I've told you in lab how to get there. Let's look at another one here. Okay, so there are several good videos in my playlist um, titled Videos from Other Sources in um, my YouTube channel, but you can just do a search on YouTube channel and search Action Potential, and you will get huge numbers of uh, possible choices that you might find will be helpful. It's best to watch that stuff moving. Now we want to talk about the synapse what occurs between this axonal ending and the next dendrite okay and messages move and these are moved through chemical uh, chemicals called neurotransmitters now acetylcholine is the most common so here's kind of what happens um, this is the end of an axon and the action potential or depolarization is moving down and as it moves down it's going to open a little gate up here that's going to allow um, calcium to come in calcium is going to well i'll tell you what let me pause this okay here is a synapse this is the end of an axon and this is uh, a dendrite and we're going to see the action potential moves down. Action potential. Cause calcium ions. Let's stop there. I want to come back. So the action potential comes down. These are little voltage gated. So as, as the depolarization passes, it opens up this channel and lets calcium in. Okay. Now, as the calcium comes in, it affects these little things here called synaptic vesicles. A vesicle, if you remember um, from chapter three, uh, is a little vesicle full of uh, acetylcholine. Now, the calcium ions cause the acetylcholine to fuse to the end of the axon and release acetylcholine into this area here called a synaptic cleft. Okay. So it dumps acetylcholine out there. Now, the acetylcholine is going to bind to these uh, little channel, sodium channels and the acetylcholine will open up the sodium channels allowing sodium to come in and start depolarizing the next cell
So you saw the gates open. Here's sodium ions, and they start flooding in, depolarizing the next cell. One of the main purposes of this process, it keeps your nervous system from short-circuiting. Basically, your nervous system can only send nerves in one direction. So you have a bunch of nerves coming from your sensory neurons to the brain and the spinal column. And then you have other ones that go from the brain to the various extremities of your body. Okay. Um, there are dozens of, again, if you look at a chemical synapse and search for that in YouTube, you will find hundreds of videos. All right, subdivisions of the nervous system. The central nervous system integrates sensory information, coordinates the body's response. And so you have sensory neurons that are gathering information, stimuli, bringing it to the brain and spinal cord. There are two motor pathways. There are autonomic, and then there are somatic. Somatic means voluntary. Autonomic means involuntary. It just happens automatically. So sympathetic, if, if something is frightening you, your fight or flight response will be fired up and your sympathetic nervous system will take control. What this does is it speeds things up in your body. Um, if you've ever been in an automobile accident or in a dangerous situation and time seemed to slow down, <clears throat> that's your sympathetic nervous system basically pumping more blood and resources to certain sensory neurons so that you gather more data to help preserve you. Parasympathetic uh, slows you down. It keeps your heart from exploding or cause or going into defibrillation because it's beating so fast. Sympathetic will speed up your, your heart rate. Parasympathetic slows it down. Um, interestingly enough, uh, just as an aside, the sympathetic nervous system gets stimulated by cocaine usage. And if you overdose on cocaine, it stops the parasympathetic nervous system from slowing your heart rate and you can have heart attacks. Okay. Um, some of the things it will take care of, uh, your heart, cardiac muscle, all of your smooth muscle, which is your GI tracts, all of your glands releasing hormones into the body at various times, where somatic, this is all about uh, control of the skeletal muscles. All right. Now here is the brain and a cross section of the spinal column. The white matter, it's easy to see, and then the gray matter is in here. Remember, gray matter doesn't have a myelin sheath. White matter does. White matter carries nerve impulses from the bottom of the body all the way to the top, whereas these little gray matter areas just go less than a quarter of an inch or an inch or whatever. And this is where a lot of your uh, reflex responses are taken care of in the spinal column. It never even makes it to the brain. Now, we're going to briefly touch on the brain. You have the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain, okay? The hindbrain is the cerebellum, the medulla oblongata, the, the spinal cord, um, the pons. This is where <clears throat> most of your instincts, um, fight or flight, this is, this is uh, less higher thinking. Some people even refer to this as the reptile brain. In reptiles, this part of the brain is pretty well developed. It handles all your instincts. You know, I'm hungry, uh, I'm in pain, uh, sex, things like that, very primal things. While this part, which deals with a lot of the, the forebrain, deals with a lot of the higher thoughts, emotions, I love somebody or I don't love somebody. Um, I hate that food or I love that food, et cetera, et cetera. This is greatly reduced in most animals. Birds and mammals have got large forebrains, but reptiles, amphibians, fish, things like that, <clears throat> they just aren't capable of the emotional parts. And so uh, these are very, very reduced.
Now this kind of, this is a good chart, you're going to want us to look at it. Um, kind of basically gives you functions for each section. Okay, this midbrain takes information from voluntary movements and sends it uh, from the forebrain to the spinal column. The thalamus here processes information and relays it to the cerebrum. That's your really well developed. The cerebrum is where all the higher thought occurs for the most part. Okay, hypothalamus takes care of homeostasis, control of most of the organs. Now you have the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the cerebellum. Um, cerebellum handles posture, balance, coordination, subconscious muscular movements. If you're a good baseball player and you're pitching, um, you, you keep practicing pitching and you are more likely to get it across the strike zone. And yet it stores that information there that helps you to do that. Um, the medulla just handles certain very, very basic needs that the body has to stay alive. The cerebrum has sem several parts. You've got um, all your motor associations here to all of your um, uh, movements. You've got uh, your speech center here. This deals with all of the sensory information coming in. This is visual. Okay, this is where all the visual information from your retinas are sorted and assembled. Hearing is right here on the side. This is the front, this is the back. Okay. All right, the senses. You have several senses. These are all handled by sensory receptors. Hearing, uh, balance, that's equilibrium, uh, touch, vision, smell, taste, pain, pleasure temperature. Now here's a good definition. Sensation is the raw input from the peripheral nervous system. Systems uh, and it arrives to the central nervous system. So those are sensations. Pain, pleasure. Perception is the brain's interpretation of a sensation. So let me give you an example. Um, you get in your eyes, basically your retina has a bunch of cells called rods and cones. Rods and cones absorb light photons and change shape. When they do, they send a nerve impulse to the ocular part of the brain, okay? And then that brain takes that pattern of nerve impulses and assembles what you quote and quote see, and that is your perception, okay? And so, when you see something, it's not guaranteed that somebody else is seeing the exact same thing, even though you're looking at the exact same thing because of perception. All right, I know that kind of scrambles your noodle, but that is uh, accurate. Uh, same thing with hearing, um, smelling, tasting. This is why some people like some foods and some people don't. And how much the environment affects your perception is a constant, never-ending debate between psychology and biology. There are those who think that everything is a learned behavior, and then there are those who think everything is an instinctual behavior, and then there's people that think it's a combination of the two. Under constant stimulation, a sensory receptor generates fewer action potentials leading to sensory adaptation, so sensations cease to reach the central nervous system. Um, that could be chronic pain, okay? And eventually, if you just keep getting these sensory inputs, your brain starts thinking, well, maybe there's something wrong here, okay? And so it will stop it. General dis uh, senses detect things, touch, temperature, pain, um, and if you look at, let's take touch. Touch has psychological impacts. Um, if you look at every species of primate on the planet, none of them are solitary. And they're constantly grooming each other. There's, and that, that helps with things like bonding and troop loyalty and stuff like that. Um, here is some of the touch receptors that you can find here.
in the skin. You have up at the top, you'll have these little things called uh, Meissner's corpuscles, and they will register things like light touch. So if you take your fingers and lightly run them across your forearm. And then you have the little Pacinian corpuscles down here that would register poke your arm. Okay? And then you even have little nerve endings that aren't attached to any kind of a sensory cell that uh, also can pick up stimuli. Touch comes from mechanoreceptors, okay? Mechanized. Basically, you know, you touch, you get poked, you get lightly touched, things like that. Um, free nerve endings will respond to pain and temperature. Smell is chemoreceptors. Now, here's how smell works. Basically, in your nose, and this is a, a bone in the nose, right? And this is your skull. And so in the nose, you have this epithelial layer of tissue, and in it, you have these little nerve endings, and your nose generates mucus, so it's moist in there. So you smell something, and these are called odorants. Okay, here's a better picture. And these odorants get into the mucus, and they will eventually attach to this olfactory receptor cell and shoot a nerve impulse up to the brain through this little ganglia called the olfactory nerve or bulb. A ganglia is just a larger collection of nerve cells, shoots it to the brain and you quote unquote smell it. The olfactory part of your brain sorts it out and decides what you smell. Okay, you can damage these and uh, you don't replace them. Now taste. On your tongue, in these papillae, you have different taste buds. There's quite a few of them. And it is influenced by smell as well. Now here, you have these little pores. These are the neurons. And so as you're eating food, the little taste particles come down here, bind to these neurons, and shoot an impulse to your brain. And that's what you quote, and quote, taste. These regenerate all the time. Okay, because you burn your tongue, etc. Now, why do we need these taste impulses? Well, each taste impulse uh, has a, uh, a purpose. You have five types of uh, taste receptors. The first is you can taste salt. Now, why do you taste salt? Well, salt is sodium chloride, NaCl. You need sodium and chloride for nerve impulses and muscle impulses to function. Okay, um, you have sweet glucose. It's advantageous to be able to, to taste sweet because we need glucose as fuel to make ATP. We can taste bitter stuff because in order to find foods, you try some plants. Whenever you taste something that's bitter, it usually means there's a toxin that will make you sick, make you not feel well. And then you have sour. Sour senses hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions, the more hydrogen ions you have, the more acidic the substance. And so it helps you constantly gain new hydrogen ions, which help with things like uh, your body's pH. The last one, the most recently found, is called umami. It's U-M-A-M-I. And it is a taste bud that senses meat. All right. And a lot of primates don't eat much meat, but the great apes do. We've seen chimpanzees kill and eat baboons, and, and gorillas occasionally will kill and eat other animals, um, orangutans, things like that. It allows, by eating meat, it allows our brains to get bigger. Okay, In the fossil record, when we look at archaic forms of hominids, um, when we saw the development of a dentition, teeth, that would facilitate ripping and tearing and chewing up meat, we saw a corresponding increase in the size of the brain case. So as the dentition to more efficiently rip apart the meat and utilize it, brains got bigger. Okay. In animals, for instance, um, here's an interesting little side of side uh, FYI chemicals for the arachnids basically they taste for mates 
Now, in a lot of cases, uh, if you're a male in an arachnid, you know, after you mate, um, you're killed and eaten. It's not fair, but hey, that's the life of an arachnid. Light. Now, here are light photons coming through the cornea and the lens. And they focus on the back of the eyeball on the retina. Those light photons um, are absorbed and change the shape of the nerve cells that absorb them, and they send a nerve impulse down through uh, the, the optic nerve. Okay, now the purpose of the cornea and the lens, and the lens can be either shortened and thickened or relaxed and drawn out, is to try to, sh to focus these photons into the smallest possible spot on the back of the retina. So let's blow up the retina. And we can see here, you can see cone cells and rod, rod cells. Cone cells see vision. Rod cells, like the purple ones there, are for low light vision. Black and whites primarily. Okay, and these all, when they, when they absorb a light photon, change shape, and then they fire a nerve impulse up through this series of nerves and eventually into these axons that all congeal at the um, optic nerve. How do we hear? Well, sound waves come in, are gathered by our ears. It's called the pina, the outer ear. They bounce through the auditory canal, and they vibrate the tympanum. The tympanum then functions to push this little stirrup into a little membraned cavity, and it does it through the basically the hammer, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The, the incus is the anvil and the stirrup. And so these things vibrate, and this little thing goes in and out, and it shoots sound waves through fluid up through the cochlea. Now the cochlea has two pathways in it. Let's see if I can find that. Here's, here's the cochlea, here's a side view. So it sends the sound waves up one side and then it comes down to the bottom and comes back out. And as it comes in here, it vibrates this little structure here and these are called your cilia, your stereocilia. These are hair cells. And as it vibrates, it bends them. And as it bends them, it uh, fires off nerve impulses to your auditory cortex. You can damage your hearing, loud noise, etc. Now, different frequencies of sound are heard at different places in this cochlea. Okay. There are some really good videos in some of my playlists for uh, hearing. So your nervous system basically takes care of uh, interacting you with your environment. Its desire is to keep you safe and able to reproduce and pass your genes on to the next generation.